My name is Shamika Kelly and I'm the Student Government Association President for the academic school year. And on behalf of the Division of Academic Affairs, I would like to welcome you to the second Dropping Knowledge series for the academic school year featuring speaker Tom Wise. And at this time, we'll have Dylan Walker come deliver the purpose. Good evening. My name is Dylan Walker. I'm a junior marketing major from Enid, Oklahoma. For over 100 years, Lincoln University has been transforming lives through the power of knowledge. The Drop in Knowledge Lecture Series, presented by the Division of Academic Affairs, contributes to this mission by exposing the entire community of Lincoln University, from students to alumni, as well as citizens of Jefferson City, to the world-class public thinkers and entertaining icons on an array of subjects. These lectures, which take place once a month and are free and open to the public, provide a unique opportunity for student interactions, faculty discourse, and community engagement. The desire is to welcome thoughts from various perspectives in an effort to expand our understanding of the society. We are pleased to have Mr. Tim Wise tonight to be this evening's Drop in Knowledge lecturer. I now ask Ms. Precious Hardy to come and introduce our Mr. Wise. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Precious Hardy, founder and president of STEM Alliance, and I have the honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Mr. Tim Wise. The first time I heard Tim Wise speak was on a YouTube video in one of my psychology classes, and I was truly amazed and inspired. First, I had never heard a Caucasian man openly speak about racism, um, but as I listened to him speak, I became convinced that the anti-racism movement definitely needs people like Tim to address the delicate issue of white privilege. Tim is from Nashville, Tennessee. He attended Nashville Public Schools. From Nashville, he went on to Tulane University in New Orleans, where he earned a degree in political science. While a student, he became a leader of an anti-apartheid group that worked with the university to stop, to get the university to stop investing in companies that did business with the apartheid government in South Africa. So even as a young college student, like many of the people in this audience, Tim was recognizing injustices around the world and finding a way to fight inequality. So tonight, I hope he will serve as your inspiration to take action against the injustices you see in your community. Tim co continued his career in New Orleans with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, where he received his training. He lent his talents to communities of New Orleans and Baton Rouge, where he worked as a community organizer and an advocate for low-income people and their families. He finally returned to Nashville, where he found like minds in a historically black university like ours. In the mid-1990s, he began lecturing throughout the country on racism and white privilege. He's, uh, he was also an advisor at Fisk University, one of the first HBCUs established for educating African Americans. Tim is a prolific writer and speaker. He has been featured on several documentaries and regularly appears on MSNBC and CNN. He is the author of six books. His latest is entitled Dear White America, Letter to a New Minority. Another book, The Culture of Cruelty, is scheduled to be released soon. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Tim Wise. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and actually to be back here. Most of you won't know this, but I actually have been here once before. I was here in, I think, 1998. So it has been a minute. Um, I've been married since 1998, uh, and I was here last in 1998. And both of those have been a long time. Like, I don't mean that like in a negative way. Like, it's been a great, uh, you know, 16 years. I'm just saying it's been a while. It's good to be back. Uh, good to be able to share some thoughts with you. I am a little under the weather today, which for those of you who have uh, shook my hand, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna try not to infect you anymore with the germs that are at this moment circulating right around here. So you might wanna think about that after when you come and buy books and hang out. Like, don't get too close, I'm just saying. Um, 
it is really good to be here. I want to start off with uh, a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, it's not really a disclaimer. It's just more a matter of moral and ethical obligation. I always try to say it at the beginning of every talk. Sometimes I forget. I'm certainly not going to forget this evening. I am, on the one hand, incredibly honored to be here. I always am. That's not just a perfunctory thing that I say because I guess all speakers are supposed to say that, you know. Um, but I say it because it's true, and particularly for me, it's true as a white man in this work, and that is to say as a white man attempting to be an ally in the struggle against racism and institutional white supremacy, I think I have an obligation, a special obligation, to acknowledge from the very beginning that part of the reason you're here listening to me, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I, I know this, uh, is because I have this particular aesthetic, that is to say as a white man, that has a lot to do with why I get to do 70 engagements a year, why I have six or seven books, why I get the attention that I get. It's not that I'm not good at what I do. Like, I'm good. You'll see. Like, I'm really good. My mama would tell you I'm really good. Like, it's going to be good. The talk is going to be good. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to enjoy it. But I'm just saying there are a lot of good speakers and there are a lot of really good writers. And when it comes to the issue of race and racism, the vast majority of those folk are black and brown, but they don't get half the attention that I get. They don't get half the attention that I get. They don't get half the speaking engagements that I get. I realize that that's about privilege. And it's really important to say that because on the one hand, I know it's important for white people to do this work, but it's especially important for those of us who are white and do this work to acknowledge the source of the wisdom that we share, the source of the knowledge to harken back to the title of this event that we drop is not white knowledge. The fountain from which that comes is a fountain of color. Folks of color, my own mentors in the city of New Orleans and afterward that helped to get me to the place where I could speak intelligibly about these topics. So I'm glad to be here, but I know that this country will not have arrived at a place where we can dispense with this conversation until and unless black and brown peoples can stand at these podiums all around the country, give the very same talk that I'm about to give, say all the very same things that I'm about to say and be taken every bit as seriously as I expect to be, right? So I just feel the need to say that. Um, I wanna congratulate <clears throat> the organizers of the event uh, number one, it's a cold night and it's a pretty good turnout. So on a cold night, I know, like it's hard. Like I didn't want to get out of my residence hall when it was cold. I, I didn't care. Like even if you bribed me with extra credit, I wouldn't come in. Like you know, so it's a good turnout and people from the community. I really appreciate you all coming out as well. Um, I particularly want to congratulate the organizers of the event because I know that these conversations are not fun. This is not fun. I did not come here to have fun. I don't think you came here to have, it's not like y'all were like, you know what would be fun? We're gonna go here and talk about white supremacy. That'll be fun. That's not fun. It's not fun to hear it. It's not fun to give it, but it's necessary. And so the fact is that it's not an, an exciting conversation. It's not a joyous conversation to have, but it's an important one. But because it is so difficult, a lot of times people don't wanna come to these kind of events because it's not a simple straight, it's not like I'm a juggler or a magician or a stand-up comic, you know, like, I'm not gonna do any of that. Like, I'm not gonna sing, it's not gonna be entertaining. It's gonna be, well, it might be entertaining, actually, but that's just because I'm, I'm like on cold medicine, so you don't know really what I'm gonna do. Um, but it's not about that, right? It's some serious talk, really serious conversation. So, in a sense, it sometimes can be very difficult to inspire people to come out to something like that. And so the fact that folks have come out, I think is something you should be congratulated on. And I wanna congratulate the audience for coming because I know there are a lot of voices in this country that will tell you, whether you're white or of color, that we don't have to have this conversation anymore, that it's superfluous. That in the words of somebody a couple years back, I remember told me, oh Tim, this thing you do, this is so 2007. <laughs> and you know what he meant, right? Like, you say, oh, you know, there was an election in 2008. You didn't hear that? Yeah, I heard that. He said, well, see, we don't have to talk about this anymore because a man of color is in the White House, so it's all good and racism can't be a problem. White privilege, what, what are you talking about? That, that can't exist if a man of color can become president. Yeah, just like, just like sexism doesn't exist in Pakistan because Benazir Bhutto became the head of state twice, right? A woman. Just like sexism doesn't exist in Great Britain because of Margaret Thatcher. Just like it doesn't exist in the Philippines because they had a woman head of state, India, Israel, et cetera. Lots of countries have had female heads of state. I don't think patriarchy has been smashed in any of those places. So my guess is racism probably has not been smashed in this one, but that's what we keep hearing. And folks try to dissuade us from having the conversation because of one individual or maybe a handful of others that they can name who have attained great fame and fortune and a certain degree of power, but it's not really the point. 
So the fact that you still will come to these conversations in spite of all the pressure not to is great. Folks will say things like, well, we don't need to talk about racism. The more you talk about racism, the more of a problem racism is. I'm sure you've heard that. We just stop talking about it, right? The problem would go away. I got that one too, like a couple years back. You're like, if people like you would just stop talking. If y'all, race hustlers, that's what we get called, race hustlers. Because that's what this is, is a hustle, right? It's a hell of a hustle, right? I was like 22, trying to figure out what I was gonna do with my life. I'm like, I don't know, fight white supremacy? That always works out well, that'll be a good hustle. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get rich and famous doing that. Like, that always works out great, right? So this is a, you race hustlers. If y'all would just stop talking about racism, racism would go away. Yeah, because that's how every social problem gets solved, by silence. Y'all know that, right? Like world hunger, we just don't talk about it. Food will miraculously appear on people's plates. Right? We don't talk about crime, nobody will get carjacked. Amazing how that works. We don't talk about educational failure. Everybody's on the honor roll. My God, why didn't anybody think of that? Because it's stupid, that's why it's not, <laughs> not a solution to the problem, right? So you can't solve a problem you don't want to talk about, but that's what we're being told. So again, congratulations for being here. I also want to say though, congratulations, because you know, a lot of times when we say we're gonna have conversations about race, people don't necessarily really want to have real conversations. We've jumped around on this thing for a long time. In fact, it used to be back in the 60s, they would actually define this conversation very differently. Like there was actually a term for it in every sort of decade, there's been a different term for this thing we're gonna talk about now. So in the 50s and 60s, right, it would be defined as, it was called the Negro problem, right? That was what it was called, the Negro problem. How are we going to solve the Negro problem? And at that time, that was very much a white black binary because prior to 1965, when immigration restrictions that had been in place since the 1880s and the 1920s were lifted, that was pretty much the binary. So they say, how are we gonna solve the Negro problem? Right, because that was apparently the problem. Black folks were the problem, the riddle to be solved, right? Then we progressed a little bit, and so by the 70s and the 80s, it was no longer being called the Negro problem or the black problem, it was called, how are we gonna deal with diversity? That was the word by the 80s, right? Diversity, because that's a, that's a pretty little term. That, means nothing and everything all at once, which is an amazing linguistic trick when you can make a word mean everything and nothing. You have pulled off a hell of a linguistic trick. So that was the conversation, right? How are we gonna solve the problem of diversity or maybe multiculturalism, that was the other term. Then by the 90s, we had President Clinton saying, we need to have a national dialogue on race. Now notice he didn't say racism. He said national dialogue on race, which is a very interesting distinction from racism. You could talk about race forever and never talk about racism if you don't want to, and that's exactly what happened. So we had this national dialogue on race. It lasted about 47 minutes. <laughs> and it never actually dealt with racism. Now, what I'm here to say, and what a lot of folks I work with are wanting us to talk about is something quite a bit different. It's not a Negro problem, quote unquote. It's not diversity and multiculturalism. It's not a conversation about race. What we have is not a race problem in this country. What we have is not a diversity problem in this country. And what we have is definitely not a quote unquote Negro problem in this country. What we have is a white problem in this country. And I wanna be clear what I mean, because it's about that moment when white folks start to get nervous <laughs> in my audiences, right? This is when white folks are like, what? <laughs> what? Like, this is gonna be an hour of this? Oh God, this is awful. Like, can I leave and not be conspicuous? Because he just said white people are the problem. That's not what I said. I said we have a white problem. I didn't say we had a white people problem. I'm talking about white people. Everybody says, oh, Tim Wise, you hate white people. Actually, that is, I love me some white people. Absolutely <laughs> love me some white people. I'm, I'm my wife that I talked about a minute ago, been married since 1998. She's white, I love her. <laughs> love her. Wouldn't trade her in for anything. Love her, right? My children, they're both white, which is what happens when two white people make babies. It sort of comes out that way, you know? So I love them. My mom, love her, she's white. My dad, I don't get along with him, but it's not because he's white. It's about some other stuff that I'm not gonna get into this evening because this is not a therapy session, but, right? But they're all white, love them. It's not about white people, it's about whiteness. And that is not the same thing. Whiteness is a political project. And I'm gonna argue that blackness is a political project. Brownness is a political project. This is not about ancestry, it's definitely not about color. Because all throughout history, there have been folks of color, as we would refer to them now, who have upheld the political project of whiteness. That's what you do when you rat out the slave rebellion that's about to happen on the plantation. That's about whiteness. 
Right? And there have been white folks who have resisted whiteness and acted in solidarity with peoples of color in keeping with the political project of blackness or brownness. We're talking about whiteness as a political construct and a social construct, not as an ancestral thing. So when I say we have a white problem, I mean we have a problem with this thing called whiteness, a system of inequity and inequality that one can choose to defend or resist. Right? So it isn't about the level of melanin in one's skin. It's not about one's ancestry or continent of origin. It is about how one comes to this thing called whiteness that we need to worry about. And the problem of whiteness, the white problem, is one principally of this unremitting denial, this inability of people called white because of this thing called whiteness and what it does to us in so many cases to prevent us from seeing clearly what folks of color can see. Not because we have some inherent vision problem. Right? This is a socially constructed astigmatism. Right? A socially constructed astigmatism that jacks our vision up to where we can't see the ink blot the way other folks do, right? You know, a Rorschach test where they hold up the ink blot and they say, what do you see? Right? And this whole country is one big ink blot when it comes to race. Folks of color can look at it, they see shapes and things that white folks apparently, because of this thing called whiteness, have a hard time making out, right? And it's always been that way. It's very hard to have a conversation about race or racism, right? When a large chunk of the nation's population can't see what you're talking about. It's like having a book club with 200 people in it or something, and like half the room read all 400 pages, and the other half of the room read the preface. And now we're gonna get together and talk about the book. And we get together in the room, folks are like, hey, did you like the book? And you're like, man, the first nine pages were awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, what about the other 391? Well, I haven't read it yet, but I'll let you know, right? Really, like that's where we are. Some people have read the whole book. Some people are at the beginning of the book. It's very difficult. And some folks are at the beginning of the book and figure like they, they know what the book's about. They don't even need to read it anymore. We're just gonna put the book down, read the cliff notes, get it online, like, you know, right, whatever, right? And so it's very hard to have a conversation when white folks are in such profound denial about the problem. Let me just document what I'm saying because that might sound hyperbolic, but it's not. It's provable, it's incontrovertible <laughs> and factual. So recent surveys, for example, where they ask white folks, hey, just out of curiosity, you know, how do you think black and brown folks are doing relative to white folks? How are people of color doing with regard to health outcomes and educational outcomes, income, occupational status, wealth, life expectancy, all of those things, right? All the different indicators of social well-being. And when white folks are asked that question, the clear majority of us in these surveys say that we believe black and brown folk are doing just as well or better than we are. Right, that their incomes are equal to or higher than white income. That their wealth and assets higher or equal to white wealth and assets. Health outcomes, that they're just as healthy, just as likely to have good health care, just as likely to have good housing opportunities and good educational opportunities. That's what the data says white folks believe. Right? That somehow there's this equanimity now, not just of opportunity, which you know we believe. Oh, everybody has equal opportunity. There's no racism anymore. We're not just talking about equal opportunity. We're saying that white folks actually think we have obtained equal results. Now, how does one believe that when every single indicator that I just rattled off says exactly the opposite? And it's not even like it's close, right? It's not even like it's like a 54, 46, like this is sort of a toss up kind of deal. It's not even close to that. What's the reality? People of color, let's talk about unemployment. Labor department data from just a month ago, not 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, last month, says what? African-American folk with a college degree, almost twice as likely as white folks to be out of work, regardless of their major, by the way. Black folks with engineering degrees still twice as likely to be unemployed compared to white engineering degree folk. Right. So uh, by the way, this is just sort of as a side note, like this is sort of interesting, right? Because if people of color with the same education are twice as likely to be unemployed, there goes that whole argument about they're taking all the jobs the hell jobs are black and brown folks taken from white people? Are these in Second Life? Is this on Farmville? Where are these jobs? Right? They're not in the real economy, apparently. Black folks with degrees, twice as, like, twice as likely to be out of work as white folks. Latino folk with degrees, about 55, 60% more likely than comparable whites to be out of work. Asian American and Pacific Islanders with degrees, 
about 25 to 30 percent more likely than comparable whites to be out of work. Indigenous Native North American peoples with degrees, 60 percent more likely than comparable white folks to be out of work. So across the board, this idea that these folk over here are doing just as well or even better is nonsense. It's sort of funny, right? We say, oh, they're taking all the jobs. First of all, like I just this is my thing. Like I'm, I'm not a real stickler on this, but I just feel like if you're gonna be a bigot, you need to be consistent. So, um, like it, it won't do for you to say that black and brown folks are taking all the jobs and then turn around and say, but they're all lazy and just getting welfare. Like you can't have it both ways, right? You got you have to pick a bigotry. Like just pick one. Like either they're lazy or they're taking all the jobs, but it can't be both, right? It's actually neither, but you can't do both. Like if you're lazy, you're not taking all the jobs, like by definition, and if you took all the jobs, you are like the opposite of whatever lazy looks like, right? So I just want, I just don't like moving targets with my racist. That's all, that's all I ask. Like I, just be consistent, pick one, stay there, so I know what I'm aiming at, right? Truth, of course, is neither one or right, but that's what you hear because whiteness has convinced apparently a lot of white folk and some people of color that this thing is equal now, that everything is fine now. What else other than unemployment? Well, we know folks of color about two and a half to three times more likely than white folks to be poor. So if we believe that that's equal, it's certainly not true. We know that the average white family in this country has about 20 times the net worth of the typical black family, 18 times the net worth of the typical Latino family, about 50% greater net worth than the typical Asian American family, even though Bill O'Reilly insists that all the Asian folk are doing fine. Right? But compared to white folk, that's actually not true when you break the data down. That's a lie that right wing folks tell to try to divide and conquer people of color and get black folks fighting Asian folk and vice versa. It's not right. It's not accurate. Right? 20 to 1 wealth, white to black. How'd that happen? Is that because white people worked harder, prayed harder, have, have some superior investment wisdom? Are you kidding? Y'all paid attention to Wall Street. It melted down a few years ago. That wasn't black people. That wasn't Mexicans, documented or not. Right? That wasn't Asian Americans, it wasn't indigenous people. That was like the, the wealthiest, smartest, best MBA having, highest SAT score having white guys on Wall Street and they jacked the economy and destroyed it. You're welcome. Right? Right? $12 trillion lost by Rich white men, almost all of it. And I, sometimes white folks get very nervous when I say they're like, oh, well, you shouldn't point out that they're white. That's racist. <laughs> no, it's descriptive. <laughs> and if they were black, we'd have noticed that. Like if black folks made off with $12 trillion of white people's money, somebody would have been like, oh, what the hell? Where these black people took all this money? How did they even get this money? How did they get this job? Right? They, oh, it's affirmative action. I know how they got it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gave all those people jobs they weren't qualified for. Well, a handful of rich white men lost $12 trillion, but nobody's questioned white men's access to banking. Nobody's like, that's it, white men, y'all are done. No more banking jobs for y'all, that's it. You've proven yourself incompetent, criminal, unable, right? That's the point. So that 20 to one wealth gap is not about talent, it's not about merit, it's not about ability, it's about access and power and the history, the cumulative history of unequal access. Over time, wealth accumulates, right? So even if income is going up for people of color, even if the income gaps are narrowing, and they are a little bit, for sure, not enough, but a little bit over the last 20, 30 years, but the wealth gap is actually expanding because wealth grows exponentially, income grows arithmetically, right? So essentially when you have things handed down to you, even if it's not much, just a little house or you know, intergenerational transfer, somebody helping you out with college, um, paying off college loans, right? Or maybe a down payment on a house, so as a result of white families being in a position to do that more often for their children than families of color, we have you know, young white couples, let's say, that are starting out in their 20s, just got married, got out of grad school, whatever, and they're debt free in a much higher capacity. Not most, I'm not saying everybody is, but I'm saying overwhelmingly what the data finds, for instance, is that young white couples starting out a few years out of college start out with about um, $20,000 head start in terms of assets compared to black and Latino families. Right? And that's because of a degree of intergenerational transfer. So it's just a little head start, but over time that accumulates. Right? If I start out debt free, I'm able to start saving money. And actually what the research has found is that black and Latino families that are doing pretty well in terms of their occupational status and their income, not only are they not getting help from their parents, because in many cases their parents weren't in a position to help them, right? but actually the younger black and brown folks are actually sending money back to their parents. 
right? Helping relatives that are older than them who haven't had the same access and opportunity. So instead of the money trail going from older to younger in black and brown families, it's actually going from younger to older, right? Which hurts the ability to accumulate wealth. It also says a lot, doesn't it, about which families are functional and which ones are. Because folks in this country like to say black and brown families aren't functional. But I would say that when you're helping your mom and you're helping your uncle and your auntie and you're helping your cousins and you're helping people, I'd say that's a pretty functional family, right? But we don't think of it that way in this country, right? That's how we talk about race. So if white folks are convinced that everything is equal and everything's fine, how do we have a conversation? How do we have a conversation when the research says, for instance, that schools that serve mostly black and Latino children, for instance, are 10 times more likely to be schools with concentrated poverty than the schools that white children attend. Twice as likely if you're black or Latino to be taught by the least experienced teachers. Half as likely as white folks to have the most experienced teachers. Five times more likely, at least in some states, it's up to nine times more likely to be arrested for drugs if you're black or Latino relative to white folks, even though the rates of drug use are virtually identical between white, black, and brown. Contrary to the stereotype, right, the data says white folks just as likely to use drugs, just as likely to sell drugs. And by the way, I don't actually need government data to tell me that. Like, I know that from personal experience. <laughs> like, if the war on drugs was actually about drugs as opposed to race and the control of certain populations, if it was actually about drugs, I promise you, I would not be giving this talk tonight. Because I don't think they'd let you Skype in a speech from prison, which is where I would be if the war on drugs was about drugs. That's all I'm saying. The statute of limitations has run out on this thing, so <laughs> I can be honest. Right? Can't touch me now. I'm good. Right? And I don't do that. I'm not trying to brag or anything. Like, I'm not saying do drugs. I, I have asthma now. Like, I can't do any of that. I'm, good. I'm, I'm done with that. But I'm just saying, right? And, and, and there was a time, you know, and... The war on drugs never caught me and it didn't catch many people like me. Not because we weren't doing the crime, but because we weren't the ones upon whom law enforcement uh, focused their efforts. And so how can we say that we're in this equitable space when we have that kind of ongoing disparity? But the problem is that that denial isn't really new. See, I guess if it were, we could sort of deal with it, right? I mean, if people are just sort of in denial because they haven't heard the data and they're not familiar with the statistics, then we could just sort of fill in the gaps of their knowledge and we can move on and everything would be all right. But that's not really what we're up against. It's not just ignorance in the simple sort of pure sense of that word, right? It's much deeper than that. Denial is sort of cultivated ignorance, right? Like you got to work at that. And apparently white folks have been working at that for a long time because whiteness has encouraged us to do so. So you can actually go back half century to the early 60s and look at the polling that was done in those days. Forget now, like I understand a lot of young white folks in particular might think that racism nowadays isn't as big a deal, I get it, you know. But I think most everybody would acknowledge that it was sort of rough in the early 60s before the Civil Rights Act, before the Voting Rights Act, before the Fair Housing Act, right? That's why we had a civil rights movement, that wasn't done for fun, that was because there was some stuff wrong, right? So. In the early 60s, if you ask anybody in America, regardless of their politics, they're all going to acknowledge that, yeah, there was a time, long, long time ago, when people of color weren't treated equally. But here's what's interesting. If you go back and look at the polls that were done then, about then, right? In other words, when 1963 wasn't the past, when it wasn't 51 years in the rearview mirror, but when it was happening, like at the time, and they asked white folks, that, and Gallup did, the Gallup poll organization, they went out, they asked white folks, hey, do you think that, they use the term racial minorities, do you think racial minorities are treated equally in your community in housing, education, and job opportunities? Now, of course, the answer, a little over a half century later, is obviously no. But in 1963, two out of three white folks said, oh yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, they're treated fully equally. Think about that. Civil Rights Act hadn't even been passed. That's the year of the March on Washington. 225,000 people marching in the late August heat in DC. People don't do that for fun. They do it because there's something wrong, but apparently two out of three white folks didn't understand they're watching the TV that night, and you know it, they're all watching the TV because that's all they had to do in 1963. We didn't have 400 channels and video games and all kinds of distractions. Like there were three channels, and, it was, and they went off at 11.30, Right, they played the national anthem and then it was just fuzz for like seven hours. Some of the young folks in here are like, what? That's the craziest thing I ever heard of. But the older folks, you know, the national anthem, there's the flag and then it's for like seven hours. And in 1963, that's all people had to do. So everybody was watching the TV. You couldn't have missed what was going on. 
It's not like white folks didn't see, oh, there's this march happening. Oh, oh, there's uh, in Birmingham, 1963, children's campaign, bombing of the 16th Street Church in downtown Birmingham, the murder of Medgar Evers in Jackson, right? Governor Wallace in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama. This stuff, everybody knew this was happening, but apparently two out of three white folks were looking at the TV screen like, I don't get it. Everything's fine. I don't know, what, what are you talking about? Racism, what? Right? 1962, Gallup asked white folks if they thought that black children had equal educational opportunity. I think the way they worded it was, do you think black children have just as good a chance to get a good high quality education as white children in this country? And again, 52 years later, we know the answer was no. Right? It's easy. No sweat off our back, is it, to acknowledge how bad it was 52 years ago. But in 1962, when white Americans were asked that question, 87 out of 100 said, oh yeah, they have just as good a chance to get a good education as white children. What's wrong? Nothing wrong. Discrimination, what? Right. Sort of interesting. How is it that otherwise functional, reasonably intelligent people could be so wrong? Either there's something wrong with them or there's something about the system that's teaching them not to pay attention to this, not to notice this. And see, I think it's the latter. I think most people are good people. I think most of those white folks that didn't see it were good folks, caring, decent, compassionate folks, with some obvious exceptions duly noted, right? But I think most people were decent people. I think most people are decent people who don't intend to oppress, but the reality is 87 out of 100 white folks or two thirds on that other question just didn't see it. Why? Because they didn't have to, that's why. White folks had the luxury, didn't they? The privilege of being oblivious. And here's the thing, no matter what you think has changed in 52 years, that right there has not changed. Just as in 1962, white folks weren't gonna get tested on their knowledge of black and brown truth and we're still not tested on that. We can continue to be utterly ignorant to the reality of how people of color in, in, uh, in this country and in places like Ferguson experience law enforcement. We can continue to be ignorant to that and have nothing happen to us, it's not on the test. We could be considered competent, informed, educated citizens and know nothing about people of color's reality. A lot of stuff has changed in 50 years. That has remained frighteningly, disturbingly, unremittingly the same. <laughs> that privilege of obliviousness, right? Doesn't make us bad people. It just means we got a really messed up system because what system allows you to be ignorant to social truth like that? Like, it's important to understand your society correctly. It's really important. That's why we have children take civics classes and history classes, right? It's not just because we have nothing better to do. The idea is we want them to understand the world they live in. But apparently, we got folks growing up not having any clue about the world they live in because they're never taught this stuff. You don't have to know this stuff. Like, if you're not required to know better, you probably won't know better. It's like, I'm oblivious to calculus, y'all. <laughs> You know why? Because I never took it. You know why I didn't take it? Because they did not make me and I was not going to volunteer. That's why. Right? I wasn't going to take it unless you made me take calculus. I knew I wasn't a good math student. So I got into high school. They're like, okay, so our rule, I grew up in Nashville, went to Metro School, Metropolitan National School, public schools. And the rule was you had to have three years of math. I'm like, all right, how can I do three years of math and not take calculus? I'm going to take Algebra 1 again. That's how I'm going to do that. Take, to add in 8th grade, I'm going to take it again in ninth grade. See if I can do better than I did in the 8th. And then I'll take Geometry. And then I'll take Algebra 2. I won't even take Trig. That's how smart I am. I'm going to avoid all of this. And it worked. They didn't make me learn it. As a result, I don't know it. So if I were to stand up here at this podium and start trying to give you calculus information, y'all would recognize very quickly that I do not know what I'm talking about. In fact, you would say, wait, hold up. Didn't he just tell us he never took the class? Aha. Exactly, but in this country, that's how we do race. White folks apparently think that we know racism better than black and brown folks, and we never took the class. When it comes to sexism, men in this country think we know sexism better than women know about sexism, and we never had to take the class, right? For those who are straight or cisgendered, we think we know the reality of heterosexism, homophobia, straight supremacy better than LGBT folks, and we never took the class. People with money think they understand the class system better than the poor, and they never had to take the class. You understand when you're a member of the dominant group, you have the luxury of not taking the class, so to speak. And as a result, you come out the other end with this gap in knowledge, but it's always been that way. And it's sort of like, um, sort of like that movie, The Matrix. You ever see The Matrix? It's a good movie. If you get a chance to see it, you, you should see it, even though Keanu Reeves is the main dude. Like, it's still a pretty good movie. 
in spite of him, because Lawrence Fishburne is in it, and that redeems the movie, that's why. And it's well written, it's a good film, you should see it. Um, and if you've seen it already, you should see it again, and you should pay very close attention to it as a film about race, metaphorically. Because if you remember, near the very beginning of the film, right, uh, 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 Keanu Reeves' character is, is offered two pills by Lawrence Fishburne's character, right? One is red and one is blue. And if you were, and this is very early on in the film, it's sort of key to the plot, right? And Fishburne's character says to, uh, to uh, Reeves' character, says, look, you can take either of these pills. You want to, you want to take the blue pill? Uh, you can go back to sleep and you can remain oblivious. That's where everybody else is. Every, just about everybody in the world is asleep and oblivious and ignorant. They're all taking the blue pill. So if that's what you want to do, you know, go ahead. You can go back to sleep. You'll never know what's really going on. Or you can take this red pill and you can have enlightenment and I can take you down the rabbit hole and show you how far it goes. And he takes the red pill, of course, which is good, because like if he takes the blue pill and goes to sleep, it's like a 10 minute movie. So it's sort of <laughs> helpful for us as moviegoers that he goes red, you know. Takes the red pill, all of a sudden he starts seeing everything that's happening in the background, right? He starts to see all this stuff. And that's sort of how race functions. It's how identity of all types functions, right? When you're a member of the dominant group, you have the luxury of just taking that blue pill all the time and going back to sleep. You don't even, in fact, you take, it's so normalized that you don't even know you're on the blue pill. Like if you're a member of the dominant group, you're walking around with a blue pill IV attached to your veins. You don't even know you have it. You're like clunking around with the IV drip and the blue pill stuff. And you're just like, what, racism? <laughs> Sexism? <laughs> Right? And then the folks who are the marginalized group populations who have to take the red pill just to figure out what is going on. Why is their life the way their life is? They're, they got the red pill, they're like, racism, do you see it? And we're like, no, blue pill, I'm a blue pill. I don't know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> Sexism, do you see it? And guys are like, no, blue pill. And I know like guys and blue pill means different stuff in the modern era. <laughs> I'm not talking about that blue pill. I'm not talking about Pfizer's blue pill. I do find it interesting everybody gets that joke, though. That's how good the marketing is on that one. Right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the matrix. right? Uh, so you have the luxury of taking that blue pill and going back to sleep. And so it's really hard to have a conversation, isn't it, about these subjects when a large chunk of the American population has been mainlining that blue pill for so many years. I think we're seeing this right now in Ferguson. And uh, I guess we don't know what's going to happen, but I think we probably know what's going to happen. I'd like to think I'm wrong, but I don't have much confidence in the likelihood that I'll be wrong. We'll see. It's taken a little bit longer than maybe some folks thought, so maybe that's a good sign. You know, it's hard to read, right? Um, but I think it's a really good example of how the lens of whiteness gets in the way of being honest about these subjects and really gets in the way of us moving forward as a country. Right, so if you look at what's going on over there, I mean, talk about an ink blot, talk about a racial Rorschach test, right? There was a Pew Research Center poll a couple months back, shortly after Mike Brown was killed, mid-August, late August, where they asked um, black folks and white folks in particular uh, if they thought that the killing of Michael Brown and the aftermath of all that sort of, you know, taught us any interesting lessons or had anything important to say about race which is a really vague way of putting it, right? It's not like they asked, do you think the killing of Mike Brown was evidence of institutional white supremacy? <laughs> they didn't say it like that. They just were like, do y'all think it has anything at all to do with race? They also asked this question back after Katrina. I remember the same kind of question. Do you think that the aftermath of the flooding of New Orleans has anything at all to tell us about race in America? Right? That's an easy, that's like so vague, it wouldn't take much to just say yes. Just like say yes, just, just say yes, right? it's easy. And when they asked that question to black folks, like 95% in the Katrina example and like 89, 90% in the Mike Brown example said yes, of course. When they asked white folks in both of those, 37% said yes, the rest disagreed. It's pretty consistent. 37% of white folks apparently think that the disproportionate impact on black folks and brown folk in New Orleans might have had something to do with race. And the other 63% are like, no, nope, I don't see it. I don't see it. I think it was about water. <laughs> And Mike Brown, no, that's got nothing to do with race. For real, because here's the deal. I defy you to find me one case in the history of this country where a law enforcement official shot a white man in the street, let him bleed out for four hours with no medical attention. Find me one. One. You won't find one. Not in the past, and it isn't going to happen in the future. Shoot a man dead and not offer medical attention. Because here's the thing. Regardless of what you think did or did not happen between Darren Wilson and Mike Brown, here's what I know the law requires of law enforcement after they shoot somebody. 
you got to render assistance at that point. That's a, an expectation, not just an ethical one, but a legal one. You don't just get to stand around and watch a dude bleed out in the street when you don't know he's dead yet. You're supposed to render assistance, but not only did Officer Wilson and the other cop who showed up not do that, they didn't let the ME in, they didn't let any paramedics in for about 45 minutes to an hour. They didn't cover him for an hour. So when you say it's not about race, how is that not? You don't even respect the body enough. Leave the body out on the street bleeding face down on the pavement for four hours. That's what folks used to do when they strung folks up by trees, leave them out there for people to see. People say that's not about race. Unless you can find me an example where that happened to a white person, then I'm gonna tell you that it is. That level of disrespect does not happen to us by and large. I'm not saying that white folks never got shot by cops. I'm just saying it plays out quite a bit differently. And for those who think it wasn't about race, I'm just always fascinated. Like, regardless of what you think the shooting did and did not happen, after all, we, you know, I guess there are multiple versions and we're never really gonna know, are we? I mean, that's the thing. We got different witnesses with different versions of this thing. And I guess we're never really gonna know, but here's what I do know. Like in the aftermath of when that happened, I don't know for sure whether the shooting was about race and I don't much care. Like I get bored by that conversation. Be like, is Darren Wilson a racist? I don't know. Was George Zimmerman a racist? I don't know. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested about what's in an individual shooter's heart. Like that to me is a boring conversation. It's not the one we need to have, right? The conversation is something much deeper. How did we respond to these incidents? And when you look at the way we responded to them, that's when you start to see something that's wrong. Because within a couple of days of the shooting, what we see on social media, right? Same people who were saying this had nothing to do with race were sending pictures around, weren't they? I'm sure some of y'all saw them. They went around hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of times. There was one in particular of a black guy with a gun pointed at the camera and a wad of mouth, a wad of cash in his mouth and like some weed on the table, right? And it was somebody who was trying to pass that off as Mike Brown, sending that picture around saying, oh, here's your gentle giant, right? Of course, it wasn't Mike Brown, it's just another black dude. Right? It wasn't Mike Brown at all, just a black dude. But apparently, a lot of white folks believed it was Mike Brown, because that's just how easy it is for us to see a criminal in the face of any black man. Oh, well, he must be, he must be that guy. Somebody said he was, I'm not even gonna research it. I'm not even gonna try to question it. So whether or not the shooting was about race, I'm pretty sure that was. And then they start sending around pictures of a guy they said was Darren Wilson, the cop, right? sitting in a hospital bed with his orbital socket blown out, all this big bruise on his face. And they'd say, this is what the gentle giant did to Darren Wilson, right? But that wasn't Darren Wilson. That was some like motocross racer that had had a bad wreck like eight years ago and busted up his face. Wasn't Darren Wilson, but people believed it was Darren Wilson. Oh my God, look at him. He's been battered and bruised. That's hilarious because there's video of Darren Wilson circling the body for 45 minutes and he's not looking at his face. He's not bleeding. He's not bruised. There's no visible injury. The original report that was filed by another cop who came and interviewed him does not mention any injury to him whatsoever. But now all of a sudden his orbital socket was blown out and people believe that. So I don't know if the shooting was about race, but I think that was. The rapidity with which we accepted that story had something to do with race. When the peaceful, completely peaceful protesters went to the Cardinals Dodgers game during the uh, playoffs, stood outside the baseball stadium in downtown St. Louis and just they just they weren't causing any trouble. Just had some signs trying to raise attention, figured that was a good place to try to raise attention the night before they'd gone to the symphony and done the same. Like, there's some brave young people, right? Just like show up at the symphony, <laughs> you know, be like, hey, bam, <laughs> like right in the middle of the symphony orchestra, you're like, we're gonna talk about Mike Brown. Now that, that's guts, like I love that. And then they showed up at the Cardinals game where you know some folks are drinking, right? Like, and now I'm gonna confront you with this, well, I know you're drunk. That takes a lot of courage. And of course, what was the response? Well, I don't know if you saw the videos or not, but these Cardinals fans come out, these white folks are like, go back to Africa, get a job, pull up your pants, saying things like, we are the ones who give y'all the rights that you have in the first place, right? So I don't know if the shooting was about race, but I think that was, right? So you don't even have to ask about the incident. When you see people line up the way they line up, that starts to tell you whether it's about race or not. Same thing happened with Zimmerman and Trayvon. 
before we ever heard George Zimmerman's version of that story, before he ever had had a chance to even articulate, oh, I was getting beaten and throttled and I'd been jumped and he reached for my gun, which is crazy fascinating because his gun, according to the video that he's showing police the day after the shooting, was right here. Y'all see the video? He's like, I reached back behind and got, wait a minute, behind? I thought you were on the ground getting beaten by Trayvon. And so now you're laying on your gun, but he's reaching for your gun that he can't even see that's back here. Fascinating. Right? Fascinating that the prosecution can't win a case with that evidence. But what happened before George Zimmerman even gave us the story about getting beaten, the vast majority of white folks, particularly white reactionary conservative folks in this country, were already lining up behind him because they figured Trayvon had to be a thug. Right? Oh, Geraldo and all these guys are like, look at him, he's a giant. They showed the video from the store where he got the Arizona iced tea, right, and the Skittles. He's a giant. Look at him. Look how tall he is. Right? being tall while black, right? <laughs> Apparently a criminal offense, and he wasn't even that tall. He's 6'2", somebody was like, he's 6'4", he was 5'11". At least that's his height when they stretched him out on the table at the morgue. So unless he's a human shrinky dink, I'm gonna assume that he was 5'11", <laughs> when he was at the store and when he was confronted by George Zimmerman. But see, we made him big, and then Mike Brown, he's huge, 300 pounds, my goodness, right? Like these are excuses for police violence, but for a lot of white folks, we can't see it. A couple other things we can't see. When you're done tonight, when you're done here and you leave, I want you to go back and I want you to Google uh, target men with guns and see the photos that come up. White dudes with semi-automatic weapons walking around big box stores like Target and Walmart and Costco or whatever, big semi-automatic rifles like strapped to them Nobody's arresting them. Nobody's calling the cops. Nobody's shooting them. John Crawford goes into a Walmart in Akron, outside of Akron, right? And he doesn't even, it's, it's a gun they sell. It's an air rifle. It's not a semi-automatic assault weapon of any type. It's an air rifle, and he's standing with it. Folks freak out. Oh, my God, he's pointing it at children. Well, the video's online. He didn't point it at anybody. He's in the corner of a store. There's nobody even to point the weapon at. He's standing there on the phone, balancing on the gun, sort of like a cane, and all of a sudden, apparently, somebody calls the cops. They roll up, they shoot him. Is that about race? The fear and the danger that we see with some people and not other people? Is it racial that five days after Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson in one of the other St. Louis suburbs south of the city, five days later, white guy commits armed robbery, breaks into somebody's house to get away from the cops who are pursuing him, runs down to the basement, is cornered by the cops, smashes the cop's hand with the door. That's assault. And he is taken without incident, arrested without injury, let alone shot. Is that racial? White dude, right? In New Orleans, back in April, white guy commits armed robberies, confronted by three officers, points a gun at him, white guy, pointing a gun at three members of the NOPD. Now here's the deal, if you don't know anything about racism in America, when you get back tonight, Google, re Google New Orleans Police Department. And everything you need to know about racism will become clear if you're in any way confused. White guy points the gun at three members of the New Orleans Police Department. And they say to him, <laughs> sir, drop your weapon. <laughs> like they had a conversation, y'all. He's pointing a weapon at them. And they had a conversation. Right? If he's black, there's no conversation. If he's brown, there's no conversation. He's dead on the street. And it would have been a justifiable homicide according to the law because he's pointing a weapon at the cops. I mean, that's real. Like if somebody points a weapon at you, you sort of have a right, I guess, to shoot them. Like at that point, I get it. But they didn't. They're like, drop your weapon. And then he proceeds not only not to drop the weapon, here's what he does. Here's what he does. Talk about white privilege. He looks at the cops and he says, no, you drop your effing guns. What? <laughs> really? Wait a minute, you're pointing a gun at me, I tell you to drop your gun and you're like, no, you. You go first, no, you, no, you, no, you, really, who's gonna shoot first? Are you kidding? And he's taken without injury. White dude kills a cop in Pennsylvania and runs off to the woods for two months and gets taken with just a scratch on his nose right here. Kills a cop and says in a letter that he wrote that it was time to start a revolution against law enforcement in this country. And they're like out in the woods looking for him. They find him, they're like, come here, sir. <laughs> we got you now, you're surrounded. Could you please come here? You killed one of our colleagues, but we're very into due process. So we wanna make sure that you get a fair trial. Could you come here? Oh, be careful of the thorns on that tree. Oh, you scratched yourself, sorry about that. Right? I'm not saying they should have shot him. 
I'm just saying, once again, we go through a litany of examples, right? You can shoot up a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, kill, what was it, a dozen people, nine people, 10 people? And then you're out in the car where you got another 50 rounds of ammunition or whatever, and they come up on you like, okay, mass murderer, please don't shoot again. Then they arrest him, he's going to trial. Then a couple weeks later, another white guy in the same town, Aurora, Colorado, just to show that guns are not dangerous, right? Walks around town with a shotgun, just walking around in public just to show people you shouldn't be afraid of guns. And they apparently weren't because he was a white dude with a shotgun. They didn't shoot him, didn't arrest him, right? It's just, oh well. Do we really think that would have happened to a person of color, right? That's where it gets racial. That's what we're talking about. But again, the dominant group a lot of times cannot apparently see that. And it makes it really hard to have this conversation at any real level. And I think what this really tells us is something about the way that the history of race and the history of whiteness and the history of anything other than whiteness has affected our perceptions. Because again, it's not that people are bad people when they don't see things, but we've been encouraged not to see certain things. We've been essentially subsidized, if you will, to remain oblivious, to remain ignorant, right? The reason we see danger in Mike Brown, but not that guy in New Orleans with the gun pointed at the cops or Eric Frayne up in Pennsylvania who killed the cop and went to the woods or whomever, right? The reason we see danger in some, a generalized danger and hostility versus others is because we, whiteness allows us, whiteness as a political project encourages us to view white people as individuals, right? Who do bad things occasionally, but it doesn't represent the larger group. So like when those white guys rip off Wall Street, right? That's just those white guys. That says nothing about white people more broadly, which of course it doesn't. It doesn't say anything about white people more broadly. But that's the point. If people of color do that kind of stuff, now all of a sudden, right, it represents the whole group. Now everybody's got to answer for that, right? And that's not an inconsequential burden. That's how the past affects the present. Because if you're raised, I mean, think about this. I think about this as a, as a dad now. A lot of times my understanding or the way I come to this issue of race is less about as an activist and an educator, a scholar, all that, more about as a father, like how do children learn race? If you think about it, right, what do we all get taught coming up in this country? Like every person, white, black, Latino, Asian American, indigenous to this continent, rich, poor, middle class, male, female, doesn't matter. All these identities don't matter. If we grow up in this country, we tend to all get taught one thing above all else, right? Either by our parents or if not by our parents, maybe by teachers, if not by teachers, by preachers, if not by preachers, by politicians, by the history book. It's sort of the national ethos. It's sort of the creation myth of America, the secular gospel. What is it? It's this idea that wherever you end up is all about your own effort. If you work hard, you can make it in America by God. And if you didn't make it, there's something wrong with you. That's the secular gospel. That's our creation story, right? And we really buy into that. But the problem is, and we buy into it even though we know it's really not that clean, right? We know it's not that clean and that simple because we all know people that have worked hard their whole life got nothing to show for it. And we know people that were born on third base think they hit a triple and they haven't earned what they have but they're convinced that they did, right? We all know that. And yet we still buy into it because we want to believe it. We want to believe it. We want to believe that we're the captain of our own ship or whatever the rhetoric is, right? That we're the master of our fate, that we can be whatever we want to be. I get it. I'm a dad. I tell my girls that. I tell them they can be whatever they want, but I insist on putting the asterisk at the end of that sentence that they can be whatever they want. What's the asterisk in this case? The asterisk in this case is the one that says, by the way, for that to be true, you're not gonna have to just work hard as an individual. You gotta understand that as a girl, soon to be a woman, there will be boys and men, and sadly some women too, who will believe that you are lesser because you are a woman. So if you really wanna be all that you're capable of being, it's not enough to work hard as an individual. You're gonna have to get together with other people and smash sexism in this culture and in this country and in this world in order to really have full opportunity. And some people get mad when I say that I tell my daughters that they, oh, you're setting them up to be victims. No, I'm not. I'm setting them up for the real world. The world as it is, not the world as we'd like for it to be, but as it is. And to not do that would be a bad parent. If I send my children down a dark alley with an electric fence at the end, but I don't tell them because I don't want them to be neurotic. <laughs> oh, just run. No, it's fine. It's yeah, there's a fence. I don't know. It might be electric. I don't know. Don't worry about it. Just go. Really, I don't want you to be freaked out. Just have confidence. Don't be a victim, right? And then they get shocked by the fence. They're like, Dad, why didn't you tell me? Well, I didn't want to scare you, you know. 
didn't want to freak you out. That would be bad parenting. But in this country, we sort of do that, right? We don't put the asterisk at the end of the statement about meritocracy and individual, rugged individualism and all that. We just say, you can be anything. Here's the problem. If we tell people that and we don't give them the sociological imagination that that asterisk signifies, right? That says, actually, it's more complicated and there are systems you need to understand. If we don't do that, then we set them up because what we do is we're basically saying wherever you end up is on you. So then if I'm a child and I grow up in that country and I look around and I see profound disparity, right? I see white folks over here, people of color disproportionately over here. I see rich folks up here, poor folks down here. I see men mostly up here, women disproportionately down here. And I've been told wherever you end up is on you. What is it then logical for me to conclude? It becomes logical for me under that kind of conditioning to assume that racism and sexism and classism are just natural, that certain people are just better than other people, right? That white folks must be smarter and they must work harder and men must be smarter and they must work harder and the rich must really be geniuses, right? I mean, think about that. Right now there are like 85 people, according to an Oxfam International report back in January, 85 people on this planet that have the same collective net worth as the poorest half of the world's population, three and a half billion people. 85 people have the same amount of stuff as three and a half billion people. Now our country says, our ideology says that that must be because those 85 people are just that much better. And to say it that way, you sort of realize, okay, that's crazy, right? That doesn't make any sense. But that's what our ideology encourages us to believe that 85 people really just work that much harder. It's got nothing to do with historical circumstance and structures of opportunity and inequality. There are 400 white people in this country with the same collective net worth as all 40 million African Americans combined. 400 white people, we could fit them in this room, with the same amount of net worth as all 40 million African Americans combined. We know 400 white folks didn't work that much harder than 40 million black folks but they got the stuff and our ideology tells us either that that was earned or let's just not think about it. Let's not think about it. Right? The four heirs to the Walmart fortune, right? Four principal heirs to the Walmart fortune, three of whom were born into the family. Christy Walton married in, her husband died. Now she's part of it. The four heirs to the Walton fortune have so much money that they could buy up every house, every condo, every town home, in the city of Seattle, or in Washington DC, or in Dallas, or in Miami, and still have enough money, 40 billion left after they bought up every dwelling in those cities to buy all the houses in Anaheim, California, or Napa if they prefer wine to Disney, right? And they'd still have 10 billion left. Meanwhile, the typical Walmart employee is not making enough to even get off of SNAP benefits what we used to call food stamps, right? The biggest chunk of workers in this country who receive SNAP are Walmart employees in most communities. How is it you got the company making that kind of money, the four Walmart heirs able to buy up the world, they got so much money. In fact, those four people have as much as the poorest 40% of all Americans, like 132 million, whatever that is, like something like that. Right? That's 170, about 100, 160 million. 160 million people, 150 million people, and four people got the same amount of stuff. And just so we put the Walmart money in perspective and realize it isn't about like added value to the society, like lots of people think Oprah's rich, right? By comparison, she's not rich. Oprah Winfrey has enough money. She could buy up all the houses in Mokina, Illinois, wherever the hell that is, right? That's how much money she has. She could own Mokina. The Walmart folks could own Seattle. They could own Miami, they could own Dallas, they could own DC, and Anaheim, and Napa, and still buy up probably Mokina and a couple other smaller places. That's how much they have. So it's not about merit, but if we train our children to believe that, they'll grow up thinking that, and what happens, that means the people who were the winners in that equation internalize superiority, because that's what we're being encouraged to do. So we think, and it goes for prison too, like if you see certain people go into jail, disproportionately and you don't have sociological imagination, that meritocracy thing tells you that must be because they're the ones who are bad. And so when the cop rolls up on Mike Brown, he's not just thinking about Mike Brown, he's thinking about the larger justice system of which he's a part that is training him in a million different ways to see danger in Mike Brown and he wouldn't see in me, right? And so young, and then people of color grow up and they internalize that. Not just white folks that internalize it, people of color internalize that oppression against themselves. What do you think happens to a people that are told every day in a million ways before lunch 
that they are defective and pathological and dysfunctional. Right? Some of them are going to start to believe that. And when you start to believe that, who do you take it out on? The only folks you can, yourself. Every time one of these incidents happens where a white cop or somebody kills a person of color who's white, right? Um, or in the case of George Zimmerman, white identified, even if technically Latino, right? Um, this is the thing that Bill O'Reilly and Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity, all these fools say, that, well, what about black on black crime? Why are we talking about black on black? Why are we talking about Chicago? First of all, the, there is problems in Chicago, but what you should know that the media won't tell you is actually the violent crime rate in Chicago is at a 30 year low right now. So we talk about it a lot. I'm not saying that that's good enough. Like there are people being hurt really seriously. Like there are real issues and the communities are hurting in Chicago, but actually the violent crime rate in Chicago and every major city in this country was worse 30 years ago. Right? In Washington, D.C., it was worse 50 years ago. The homicide rate for black men was higher in 1953 than it is today. That's a fact. So when we talk about black folk being out of control and black communities being cesspools of crime, most people say they've never been in black communities over that period of time, right? But they just go with that because that rhetoric sounds better. And so they say things like that. Why don't we talk about black on black? Well, we could talk about that, I suppose. Of course, we really shouldn't call it that because when white folks kill white folks, we don't call it white on white crime. So when we racialize crime between black people, we're actually trying to send a message, aren't we? That's not about who the victim was and who the perp was. That's trying to racialize the pathology and say there's something about blackness. But if we're gonna have that conversation, let's at least be honest enough to ask the question, where did that self-hate come from? It's like Malcolm X said, who taught you to hate yourself, right? White supremacy did that. Whiteness as a political project did that. Black people didn't teach black people that they were unworthy of life. Black people didn't teach black people that they were lesser than. They didn't teach black people that their lives meant nothing. White supremacy did that. So if and when we have that conversation, let's at least be honest, let's hold up a mirror to the culture that taught that lesson. Otherwise, we're not having a real conversation. We're just passing the buck along and saying, that's on y'all, that's somebody else's problem, we have nothing to do with that. But whiteness has everything to do with that. Internalized superiority, internalized oppression, two sides of one coin that we have to address. And we don't have the luxury of ignoring how it affects us, but it does affect us, because after a while, it, it seeps into all of us. This isn't somebody else's problem, this is our problem. If you're taught this stuff, if you are given these stereotypes year in and year out, it's gonna affect you. You can choose to resist it, and I'm glad that a lot of people do, but you have to choose to resist it. Otherwise, it'll control you. I do these workshops where I ask people, like, take out a piece of paper, write down every stereotype you can think of, of black people, Latino folk, Asian folk, Jewish folk, um, gay folk, uh, 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 disabled folk, Muslim folk, whatever, like any category, right? And I've never had anybody in the room seem confused by the instruction. Like no one's ever raised their hand and said, I can't think of anything. Can I Google it? Because I'm at a loss. Stereotypes of Latinos, what? I, I can't think of one. Everybody knows what they are. They're also very quick to say they don't believe any of them, right? Oh, I, I'm writing them down, but I don't believe any of them. I just, I'm just writing them down. But what does the research say, right? The research says if we're aware of stereotypes, it's very easy for them to be triggered. That's what the research on subconscious bias has found. Right? That just knowing about the stereotypes, and we're all familiar with what they are, it doesn't take much to trip them. It doesn't take much to trigger them, right? Anything can trigger those stereotypes. So a person of color that does something that, that, that sort of reminds us of a stereotype, that ends up sticking in our mind. In a way that a white person did the same thing, it wouldn't, right? So you can have presidents of the United States that like can't speak the language real well, you know, like mispronounce every fifth word, make up words that are not in the dictionary, and people sort of think it's just cute or it's just Texas, right? It's never ascribed to whiteness, right? But if Barack Obama had been on the campaign trail mispronouncing basic words of the English language, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't be calling him president right now, right? Because it would do what? Trigger stereotypes about competence. Same thing with men and women, right? In an interview situation, the research says if a woman comes across as too animated, right? right? Which they tell men, like you should be really, when you're in that interview, right? You should be really, Go get her, you should be really like, you know, you should be excited and enthusiastic, but women know that if they get too enthusiastic, it can trigger a stereotype about what? Emotionalism, which is then seen as a negative in a woman, in a man, that's fine. Like, be, like I'm doing all this stuff with my hands, this is like what I do, and it doesn't ever freak anybody out. Like nobody really gets freaked out about that, right? But women do that, it's like, what's wrong with her? <laughs> she started scaring me now, what's wrong with her, right? And so, 
here's our situation, right? Where we've all internalized these stereotypes and we've internalized them because advertising works, right? Companies spend billions of dollars to sell you products and it works. That's why they take out all those TV ads, right? They know that if you see an advertisement like 12 times, you'll buy their product. That's what the research says. 12 times is enough to increase the odds of you buying their toothpaste or their toilet paper or their tennis shoe or their smartphone. You know advertising works because they got y'all buying breakfast tacos at Taco Bell. <laughs> nobody wanted that. Nobody was lobbying for that. There was nobody sitting around three years ago like, you know what we need at 5.30 in the morning? A breakfast taco. Nobody ever said that. But somebody in the Taco Bell marketing department was like, you know what, let's create a breakfast taco and see how it goes and we'll sell it to them. We'll run a bunch of ads. All of a sudden folks are like, oh my God, it's 6.15. I haven't had my breakfast taco. I gotta go get me one of those. If they can make you think that you need a breakfast crunch wrap with some eggs and some beef and some hot sauce and ugh, at six o'clock in the morning, I know some of y'all are like, I would never eat that, but you have eaten it. You've had it, right? I mean, you've had it. If they can make us believe that we need that, if they can sell us on a breakfast taco at six in the morning, I'm pretty sure they can sell us on racial stereotypes because we saw that ad more than 12 times. Growing up, right, we've heard that advertising all of our lives, we've been exposed to it. So we have to own that. That's not somebody else's problem, that's on us. And we are the reason that things like the shooting of Mike Brown happen. That can, you know, maybe we get real smug and we think we would never do that. I remember when Zimmerman killed Trayvon, right? A lot of really well-meaning people, well-meaning white folks, said they're walking around with I am Trayvon Martin signs, right? And I remember thinking, oh, nice try. Like, I, I, I like the empathic, caring, compassionate statement that you're trying to make. But the reality is you're not Trayvon and you'll never be Trayvon. And if we really had to be honest, you're a lot more likely to be George Zimmerman whether you want to be or not. And that's not meant to be a criticism, again, of white people. It's a criticism of whiteness and what it does to make us scared of certain people. Or not scared, because let's be honest, George Zimmerman wasn't afraid of Trayvon. Right? Just like Michael Dunn wasn't afraid of Jordan Davis. Right? Wasn't afraid. You don't approach somebody you're afraid of. Right? You don't mess with somebody who scares you. You avoid them. I'm afraid of lions. I don't screw with them. Right. If I saw a lion, like when Michael Dunn came on Jordan Davis and his friends in the SUV and they were blaring music that he didn't like. And he says, I was afraid they had a gun. Well, if you thought they were, you should have gotten in your car and run. They got a gun. You don't challenge them. You don't tell them to sh turn your music down if you're afraid of them. If I saw a lion playing loud music, I wouldn't be like, hey, lion, stop playing that loud music. I would go the other way because I am afraid of lions. So that's not about being afraid. That's about having contempt. It's contempt for black life. Contempt for Michael Brown, contempt for Trayvon, contempt for Jordan Davis, contempt for one after another litany. We go down the line, Patrick Dorisman, Aswan Watson, Amadou Diallo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that's where we are. But we better get this together. Like we don't have a lot of time. I mean, I'm not exactly sure how to get out of it. I'm, I'm not the one to give you that advice, by the way. I mean, I think the young people in Ferguson and other places around this country that are doing some amazing organizing, they're the ones you need to look to for solutions, not, not middle-aged white men like me. Like I, I'll, I'm pretty good at diagnosing the problem, giving you a way of analyzing and thinking about the problem, but it's those young people that are gonna lead us out of this, and we need to follow them, we need to show up for them. Right? But I will tell you that we better do it quickly. We don't have the luxury of sitting around and like thinking of this as an academic issue, because the truth is we got 30 years left, maybe, 30 years, half the population is going to be white, half the population is going to be people of color. That's just a fact. Doesn't matter what people think about it, that's a fact. And if we get to that day when it's a 50-50 country and we still got this level of inequality, I don't see how we survive. I haven't figured that out yet. How do we make it? If we get to that point and people of color still twice as likely to be out of work, three times as likely to be poor, 1 the net worth, nine years less life expectancy, double the rate of infant mortality, double the rate of low birth weight children, born to moms in the black and brown half as opposed to the white half. I don't see how that's a recipe for social survival. I think it's a recipe for disaster for all of our babies and our grandbabies and all of us, all of our children, ourselves, our communities. We can't survive divided like that. So this is not just an academic matter. And it's not a matter of charity. It's not a matter of, oh, we need to have more equality so we can help those people, right? This is about self-help. This is about figuring out how all of us are gonna pull out of this iniquitous 
and unequal and, and, and unjust system for the benefit of all Americans, for the benefit really of the world, because we have such an outsized influence on the well-being of people who are not even in this country. We need to have a much different system, and that means we've got to be honest about the problem in this country, which is a white problem, the problem of whiteness and what it does first and foremost to people of color, but what it does also to those of us called white by roping us in and making us believe that this system works for us. It might work for us relative to people of color, but in the long run, this thing isn't going to work for anybody for very much longer. Thank you all so very much for being here. I appreciate your time.